Hi everyone, we will be starting now. So the topic of today is, as you can see on the screen, new, new diagnosis of attacks of the UK, and it will be presented by Igor Peters and Surinder Sharma. Uh, Igor Peters is a partner at Transfer Pricing Associate in Amsterdam. He has over 20 years of experience in international tax and transfer pricing. Uh, his previous in experience includes eight years as an in-house tax counsel in Germany and Netherlands with a focus on tax risk management and transfer pricing. He is also a member of the Dutch Association of Tax Advisors. He, uh, his strong industry experience covers heavy machinery, oil and gas engineering and construction and consumer electronics. He has previously been involved in provision of transfer pricing advisory services in various matters such as corporate mergers, acquisitions, divergers, etc. He has also been involved in uh, preparation and negotiation of APAs with the Dutch tax authorities and has also been working soundly with the, the Dutch tax authorities in other negotiations. Our second speaker of the, today is Sarinda Sharma. He is also a partner at the Amsterdam Office of Transfer Pricing Associates. He has an overall experience of 17 years of working in UK, India, US and now in the Netherlands. He has been working in transfer pricing for the last 13 years in the areas of planning, documentation, and controversy with major organizations and multinational corporations to develop practical transfer pricing strategies. He is a regular speaker at public forums and writes articles in international tax journals. His area of expertise covers tax effective planning assignments, APAs, and dispute resolution. He has also been working closely on thin capitalization and advanced thin cap agreements and loan and guarantee fee benchmarking transfer pricing documentation. With that background, I invite the two speakers to start the presentation of today. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Avish. Okay, the agenda for today, a short, uh, we will give you a short background to the new uh, DPT, explain some exemptions from the DPT, explain how the main charging provisions work, and if we have the time, also a little bit on the reporting and the paying of the tax. So let's start with the background of the diverted profit tax. Now you would expect that uh, most countries, including the UK, would wait for the whole OECD BEPS actions to be uh, multilateral implemented, but the UK took a leap forward and unilaterally introduced the diverted profit tax and it's uh, their answer to the uh, big companies. I think most uh, ex examples are like, like Google and the Amazon and the Apple and where the UK government perceived it as they were not paying their so-called fair share to the government and that the existing rules in the UK for transfer pricing and permanent establishment definitions did not go far enough in protecting the UK tax basis. So in that sense, has the, the diverted profit tax been introduced to effectively override the application of transfer pricing regime in the UK? and the related party payments and the, especially the existing UK uh, PE or permanent establishment definition. It starts to be effective already on April 1, 2015. So the initial legislation was published and then almost one week later it was effective. So there was hardly any time for the public or the, the enterprises to reflect and comment on it. Um, yeah, what, what is uh, for first to, to note the, this new tax, it's not an uh, add-on to corporate income tax, it's a separate tax with its own law and the rate is 25% which means it is 5% higher than the normal UK corporate income tax and applicable to any diverted profits. Uh, Igor, uh, it's very interesting to see that this uh, UK DPT, which is more like a unilateral tax uh, action by the UK government, 
but when we look at the the the, the BEPS uh, output by the OCD in October last year, uh, which has all all those principles, uh, you know, for example, related to the substance that the company should earn the right profits based on value creation, based on what ac economic activities they carry in the in that country. So where do you see that? Do you think, uh, although UK DPT is a unilateral action, do you think it, it is somehow aligning uh, it, itself with the BAPS uh, action which were rolled out by the OCD a couple of months back? Yes, in that sense that, that, that I think the perception in the UK and then mainly relating to companies like, like and Starbucks and uh, Google is that bigger companies were not paying their fair share and the, the diverted profit tax was then the answer to the, well, I think perceived outcry from the UK public to well, align those multinationals with uh, the, the, what they think is a fairer share. And they took a lot of concepts from all the OCD BEPS actions uh, adjusting the PE definition to uh, mo modern business models is is something that's typically BEPS, uh, where where we will discuss that later, uh, where there are companies that do not have uh, economic activity of itself, so meaning nominal uh, personal on the payroll or nobody on the payroll, kind of shelf companies. I think that's one of the issues that is uh, considered to, to cause BEPS, uh, base erosion and profit shifting. So there's a lot of concepts packed together in this uh, legislation. And of course, yeah, it might be a contemporary uh, uh, tax rule that the moment uh, all the BEPS actions are being implemented in all the countries that also the UK might not have uh, well, uh, need for, for this DPT anymore and might uh, withdraw even this uh, legislation. But my only worry is that if I'm, a, if I'm a tax director of an MNC which has operations in many countries across the globe, then I would slightly get worried if the UK DPT remains in action for a long time and other countries, they also start following the same pattern of implementing their own uh, diverted profit tax regulation and then you know it's kind of unilateral and uh, and and you can possibly also throw some light you know how the tax city uh, benefit will still be there so for me it it is like too many double taxation happens happening for me in too many countries so what's your take on that uh, do you think uh, there is uh, enough risk uh, on double taxation uh, when i look at the uk dpt Yes, I think so, because on, on one hand, it urges companies to look at their, their TP policy and their, their setup, and uh, as, as I mentioned, it is a different tax than, than corporate income tax, and saying that means also that it's outside the UK tax treaties. And DPT is not uh, covered by uh, tax treaty. So in that sense, you're completely right. It will cause double taxation. Perhaps some non-tax treaty countries uh, outside the, the UK, they, they could be uh, able to, to mitigate it due to exemptions or credits. But if there is tax treaty, principally, it will fall out of scope. And yeah, we can only hope that, that not all countries follow the same uh, route as the UK. I think Australia was considering to implement similar legislation and they backed off and yeah, probably are waiting for the BEPS actions to be implemented in, in all other uh, OECD countries uh, via this, uh, partly via the multilateral treaty. I think the 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 time will uh, actually definitely I, when I look at the time uh, time period, 2017 will be, be will be the year when we have uh, something on the the multilateral instrument you know needs to be uh, agreed upon uh, by 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 different countries as part of the uh, PEPS package by the OECD. And I think at 
at, at that point in time, I think we will have a much clearer picture, uh, you know, what stage the UK DPT will have in terms of, you know, whether it will be kind of a shut case or whether the government will still prolong it. Yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it might be, and then in, in two years that everything is uh, withdrawn and it has just been a kind of yeah, pre-election show for the public and then it might be even, uh, yeah, we call that teeth, teethless uh, legislation. But for, for the moment it looks uh, pretty tough. And, and yeah, it still has to be seen how does it work in uh, practice. So let's go to the, I think the, the okay, next slide, number two. And when do you fall within scope of the averted profit tax? Uh, let, let's turn that around and uh, define when are you not in scope. Uh, transactions where none of the parties to the relevant transactions are large companies. So any uh, yeah, micro uh, or uh, medium enterprise following the EU definition that are companies with 250 FTEs or smaller or 50 million euro turnover or smaller or 43 million euro balance sheet totals for smaller and they are outside uh, the scope. Uh, it should be a transaction with uh, connected companies, right? connected to the foreign company, your business uh, partner and it should have transactions where the UK related sales revenues of the group company is exceeding 10 million. Uh, are you under that threshold? You're outside the scope of the um, DPT. Are you just over it? You might still escape uh, when your UK related expenses are 1 million British pounds or less. And one yeah, uh, major uh, group of transactions is excluded, of course, for the, the uh, city city activities that are the financing transactions that are totally carved out of DPT. Okay, in the next uh, examples, we will assume that all transactions are between connected parties and that all parties to the transactions are large and no uh, independent or independent agents are involved in this. Let's continue with uh, uh, the build-up of the diverted profit tax. The two charging provisions. We start with uh, charging provision one, that is relating to entities or transactions lacking economic substance. Um, don't don't be uh, yeah, mistaken by the the word lacking economic substance. It is not in the sense of transfer pricing, economic substance, where you would think of significant people functions or uh, a lack of uh, those people. But we'll come back to that later. In the example, we have a UK company, UK Limited, paying a royalty for services or they pay other fees to a foreign company. Or it is uh, UK Limited paying to an um, empty foreign company, which on its turn again is paying to uh, another foreign company. That includes therefore uh, direct and indirect uh, payments made to foreign companies. So how how is charging provision one working, and when will it uh, apply? And the first check is there a payment from the UK to a foreign connected company. And uh, the earlier slide, there was a royalty payment from the UK to foreign co. And is there a tax saving? And this condition that is being tested is called the effective tax mismatch condition. Take into account that the uh, UK corporate income tax rate is 20%. And then you simply straightforward have to check is the foreign 
corporate income tax rate less than 80% of the UK uh, tax. So any country that would have a tax rate below 16%, then, then your payments would fall into scope for, for uh, this test and the effective, effective tax mismatch condition. And then there might be an um, escape or, or double test. Uh, what is then the insufficient economic substance condition test? And does the tax savings, the difference between the 20% and the 80%, are there other reasons why the transactions was set up like that? And what are the other non-tax financial benefits? Um, in the effective tax mismatch condition, um, any tax that is due for the transaction is taken into account. I assume there is a 5% UK withholding tax on the payment to the foreign country, then also this one is deducted from the 20. So then you would be looking at a tax saving of only 15% and not uh, the full scope. As we said, in order for the diverted profit tax to apply, the tax saving must be less than 80% of the UK tax reduction. And let's, let's assume we have a payment here of uh, yeah, 100 to a foreign related uh, company and we did not make the 80% threshold test. What is then the other uh, chance to escape the diverted profit tax, the so-called insufficient economic substance test? Again, uh, mis misleading for transfer pricing or tax uh, people because it does not require the taxpayer to evidence the taxpayer to evidence uh, that there is economic substance, but it is about quantifying the financial benefit of being located in a particular territory and excluding any tax saving of, or financial benefits. And the key issue is therefore the quantification of the non-tax benefits. And let's go to the next slide. So how can we quantify this non-tax financial benefit? And you have to take into account all kinds of non-tax financial benefits like purchasing power, and did you increase the order size or reduce the price per unit? Uh, salary costs, are the salary costs in the other country uh, yeah, substantially lower and are you able to quantify that? In that sense, you had other reasons to, to move that activity and, and purchase that activity from the foreign uh, company, just beside all the, the tax benefits. Uh, centralized specialist labor and management, more efficiency. And then uh, the, the difficult part of that, of course, is how do you quantify it, increased efficiency? Uh, can, you, can you make a valuation of that? Yeah. I think that's a, that's a challenge, of course. And, and Igor, one example I can think of is that uh, if we have, say, a central procurement uh, uh, office in the UK, and uh, and and this UK entity is say rewarded uh, say on a costless basis, and then I ha I have other profit centers which are spread across across uh, various countries, and some of them they behave like principal. Now the question here is that when I have to uh, justify that uh, I'm having a cost center type of profile in the UK, uh, it it was not driven by tax. It was more driven by commercial decision. So. I have more of non-tax savings. So when I look at this particular example, here I would like to, I need to demonstrate that uh, if I follow this structure, then what non-tax benefits am I generating? So possibly I need to look at that. Does that really leading to some type of cost savings for the group? For example, having a, a lower uh, uh, prices from the vendor. Although I may not be, being a UK company, as I'm a cost center, I may not be uh, uh, responsible fully for those lower prices, but 
maybe another principal might be responsible but then this cost center model helps to achieve consolidate all orders and I able to agree a better price from the vendor so I think these type of savings uh, we would be looking at and this is uh, somehow connected to what we uh, uh, what we uh, do uh, in transfer pricing in the sense for example we have uh, situations like we have location savings you know when a company moves from a high a high cost jurisdiction to a low cost jurisdictions you have a low labor cost uh, for example you have sometime a low energy cost so those type of savings we need to uh, calculate and if those type of savings which we call as non tax savings if they are uh, uh, more than the tax savings i think uh, we, uh, the the taxpayer can build a solid case around uh, you know the specific structure uh, which they have created uh, in the uk market yeah i think in internally and you would you would have made already a kind of business case and then of course you would, would partially i guess take into account uh, tax benefits but for sure also uh, the, the management would look to the non-tax benefits of, of moving something restructuring something and then yeah, I think a business case takes into account a kind of yeah net present value of those benefits. So in that sense, you have most likely already uh, quantified, yeah. or at least you have the, the tools in house. I think to uh, quantify this uh, benefit. And one one of the examples is uh, where there is a technology company in Bulgaria. And the corporate tax rate in uh, Bulgaria is 10 percent and this group is owning IP and this technology company in Bulgaria is performing significant R&D activity and the labor costs in uh, Bulgaria are, are significantly lower than in the UK so there you would be able to quantify the non-tax benefit by giving the difference and then for the, for the whole activity and same for salary or uh, office overhead just renting an office but for sure it's it's a challenge to uh, yeah, make make this calculation and also present it in a well, certain way to the UK tax authorities to convince them but still it's an uh, important step in the deferred profit tax uh, mechanism and one point I would like to highlight here is that when we do this type of calculations of uh, you know arriving at the non tax savings account uh, it will be important uh, to actually ensure that if I for example do some calculation on location savings the, the next question would also be there uh, which is uh, obviously not part of the UK DPT is like if there are some savings how that savings are shared between uh, for example uh, the principal and uh, the cost center in the UK and then it's kind of a negotiation and some location savings will go to UK or and or uh, to the principal so one has to be mindful of the, this fact that whenever we do such calculations we need to ensure that if there is a situations where those savings would need to attribute to the UK right that analysis yeah. should align with what uh, intercompany pricing model I have agreed with the UK. So if more location savings should go to the UK, that should accordingly be reflected somehow in the intercompany pricing. So this is some point which a taxpayer should be mindful of of this when uh, such calculations are being done. Yeah, I think there there uh, a lot of uh, yeah transfer pricing principles still are being uh, applied allocating it so one, one of the, the other important steps in uh, diverted profit tax is the identifying the so-called alternative provision in the example where the royalty payment has been made to the foreign company by the UK company still it is clear that the UK company would need anyhow to uh, yeah, be able to avail over this this IP and make even to a third party make perhaps a payment to it 
So what is then the alternative transaction? And still, it is a payment of, uh, in the example, it is uh, 10 million uh, royalty. The other example that's coming from the guidance, in the, in the slides we also provide you with a link to the guidance from the HMRC. Uh, there is a UK trading company with a foreign parent that wants to purchase some plant and uh, machines. And instead of purchasing it directly, the foreign parent sets up a company, P&M Foreign Co., in a low-tax territory, and that company is on its turn purchasing the, the P&M and then leasing it to the UK company. Well, here is the alternative transaction that the UK uh, company would have purchased uh, plant and machinery itself. And this is, I think, a pretty tough example to, to structure such alternative provision. In the, the second schedule on page 8, and you have the royalty payment. And there it is uh, still considered uh, the IP was uh, required, so there is no alternative provision because it's very reasonable that the UK company would make a payment to the owner of the IP or to someone who has the right to exploit the IP. However, still, you're not home and dry, so to say, because now we have this foreign co, which is lacking economic substance, so therefore it is considered to be artificially inflated. Here again, economic substance is not the economic substance test, what we discussed earlier, but here economic substance is looking at uh, so-called SPF, significant people functions. Is there real activity or not? And let's assume it's not, uh, yeah, there, there, there is no activity, yeah, there are no people on the payroll that are managing this uh, IP. Then from a DPT point of view, this uh, royalty payment will be considered so-called artificially inflated and therefore subject to a 30% restriction. Meaning, instead of the 10 million royalty payment, it is considered to be a royalty only of 7 million. Now this difference between 10 and 7 will then be on its turn subject to the diverted profit tax at a rate of 25%. Yeah. And well, now, Igor, when we look at this example, in this example, both IPCO and foreign co, they lack substance, you know, in, in terms of uh, what we call that, those uh, important functions which are part of the IP development, like development, enhancement, uh, maintenance, uh, protection, exploitation. Now, if we have another situation, uh, where UK company is paying same royalty uh, payments to uh, uh, company A, which is the legal owner, like in our case is IP Co. And we have other group companies in foreign countries. They are managing and uh, managing those uh, significant IP functions, right? So in that case, to I would imagine that DPT would not be a problem for the UK company because those functions are in existence and performed by other group companies, right? Although the contractual relationship is between the UK and the legal owner, legal owner of the IP. So although the UK is paying 10 million, but at the same time, all those significant functions are already performed by other group companies. They're also outside UK. Yeah, so so in inside the group, uh, all the... Uh as they're described in Action 8, so-called DEMPE, yeah, the Development, Enhancement, Maintenance, Protection, and Exploitation functions are well, be, being exercised, but not by this uh, legal owner. Yeah, there, I think the whole setup for this might be a kind of treaty shopping. Uh, in the old days, this was a perfect structure, perhaps, to reduce withholding taxes being paid. But here, yeah, there, there, as mentioned before, I think several BEPS topics are, are combined into this uh, diverted profit tax, especially the words of uh, action number eight and the, uh, the, the 
abuse of tax treaties. So it's it's uh, yeah quite quite broad range this DPT is uh, covering in uh, practice and, and tries to tackle and still it, it urges you to uh, yeah, re reconsider so it's not really clear whether it's really effective or are companies reacting to it by, by restructuring but then you go looking all this then my next question which will come to my mind as a taxpayer is that what can we what can I do to mitigate the DPT charge yeah what can you do as, as, as mentioned it is for to, to consider your business model and one of the, the exits the DPT is, is uh, giving you is making a transfer pricing adjustment yourself which has the benefit that you're falling inside the scope still of the corporate income tax uh, where the rate is 20% and not the DPT tax rate of 25% uh, you would have the possibility to make a corresponding adjustment in the other country if, if of course they are happy to uh, join this and still to be seen uh, is there perhaps a foreign tax credit given in the UK for the additional tax you might be paying outside the UK I think that's a little bit unclear at the moment whether or not the UK will give a tax credit for this uh, additional foreign tax but you know when I, when I look at the current situation where uh, you know this DPT is not uh, uh, is not provided any benefit under the tax treaty between the UK and other countries and if I as a taxpayer in the UK voluntarily I, I go and make corrections and I think the, 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 the benefit which I get is that I'm, I'm down from 25% tax to 20 but I still run that double taxation but if I don't take any action if the adjustment is made by the HMRC then I still run that double taxation because if whether I get that correlative adjustment in another country but, if, but in that case my tax rate goes up from 20 to 25 so if I take voluntary action the main benefit is that you know I'm down to 20 percent but that double taxation risk is still is not done away with if I you know even if I move voluntarily yeah because then it, it's it's not uh, yeah, not likely that the UK will give a, a credit for this additional tax and with the DPT I said you're outside the treaty network or treaty scope whether you're, you're uh, stuck in a, in a somewhat strange situation and normally a territory that makes the upward adjustment to the profit is not a territory that will give you a credit in relation to that adjustment and therefore we, we yeah, uh, wait and, and see how the UK company can um, adjust this and, and yeah, we're not sure we, but we expect uh, the HMRC would allow credit for the additional tax paid in the other jurisdiction so it's not not entirely clear whether this uh, DPT credit would be allowed or not so what would we expect on a longer term uh, last week or the week before the European draft council directive against uh, tax avoidance was uh, being published one of the um, yeah, solutions or European proposal there was the possible uh, deferral of your exit tax so in that sense uh, it makes sense perhaps to, to wait a little bit with uh, restructuring and wait for that directive to be implemented if it's also that uh, part of the directive survives but immediately uh, start restructuring because of DPT yeah, most likely uh, the DPT will be uh, yeah, recalled when, when other BEPS measurements are being introduced into the UK and it's I think not, not for nothing that Australia decided to wait and not implement a copy of the UK diverted profit tax 
could wait for the BEPS as it uh, for sure was, was expecting uh, yeah, negative uh, effects of going uh, unilateral, taking, jumping the queue, as you said. So you could, when I look at this, it's, it appears to me that uh, this uh, uh, charging provision one is uh, is very, it, it's far reaching, and uh, it it is kind of operating in exit in ex, in an exit territorial manner. So, but then we also have this uh, uh, charging provision two. So, can you throw some light on that as well? Yeah, charging provision two is the um, yeah I would, I would say is is the name giver or the, the nickname giver for the DPT and I think uh, nickname for DPT is uh, Google Tags because that's the classic example uh, the avoidance of PE so it was reasonable to assume that the foreign company has together with the connected party taken steps which are explicitly designed to avoid a UK permanent establishment and take the example of Google. Google Ireland restricts the activities of its marketing and sales subsidiary in the UK such that the contract cannot be concluded by Google in the UK but only by the platform in Ireland. Only the UK customers have direct connection with Ireland and the, the people on the ground in the UK are just providing their marketing activities. In that sense, uh, they are not creating an agency P. And the other uh, uh, classic example for, for DPT is uh, Amazon. Uh, Amazon in, uh, with a European headquarter in Luxembourg. And anywhere in the EU, including the UK, there are large warehouses from where it is delivering all the, the books and goods that are being ordered online, also online by UK customers. And in that sense, it is avoiding a UK permanent establishment because currently still the, the uh, having a warehouse in a country for purely delivery of goods does not create a PE presence. It's considered to be auxiliary in nature. Uh, also there the OECD is uh, proposing to reconsider this is being so uh, proximate to your clients is that really a yeah, core part of your business model uh, if you order something online at least I'm happy when it's there next day and not three weeks so it might be uh, part of your uh, core part of your business model so already the, the OECD is considering whether it's not a yeah, artificial way of avoiding uh, PE. And there you clearly see that the UK is jumping the queue and they have constructed the so-called notional UK PE. And profits must be allocated to this uh, notional UK PE on an at arm's length basis. And the term notional is put there as a reference to the fact that the PE is a fiction rather than an actual PE. So again, here we have to go to the earlier tests we did. Uh, is there a tax mismatch in addition to the tax avoidance motive? Looking at the scheme where foreign co is having this uh, UK sales and marketing company which uh, is then, then constructed as the uh, notional PE so the profit is reduced uh, by making payments to other connected parties so which amount is available to allocate to the UK um, has to, has to be calculated then. Huh? What what would be the, the allocation method? Again, we go back to uh, charging provision one, and you have take take the example of uh, Amazon. You have avoided UKPE. 
Now Amazon Luxembourg must allocate profits to the UK as if its warehouse did indeed create a UK PE or UK notional PE. But you, yeah, would we be able to imagine that, that uh, Amazon Luxembourg on its turn would pay royalties because it makes use of the platform of Amazon? It's uh, kind of technology or IP related uh, payment. But it would be outside of Luxembourg paying to, well, knowing Amazon would be Bermuda or the US. So again, it's Luxembourg on its turn is reducing the amount of profit it has available to allocate to the UK notional PE. And by applying charging provision one to Amazon Luxembourg, it is possible that HMRC could conclude that Amazon Luxembourg wouldn't have made that payment under the alternative provision. Or more likely in the example, it would restrict the amount uh, because there is no activity and it would be meet the 30% restriction rule because Bermuda or the other uh, legal owner, the payments are being made and do not have sufficient uh, substance, substance then in the sense of significant people function. Hence, it's pretty uh, complicated. On slide number 11, 3.6, and you see the, the double steps you have to take. Again, is there a tax saving? Is the 80% test met? And what is the rate in Luxembourg? What is the rate in the other receiving countries? And is therefore the non-tax as a escape, non-tax financial saving higher than the tax saving? And where we spoke about the, uh, yeah, how can you cal calculate that or evaluate that? What is the alternative provision? Is that uh, possible? And especially again um, for, for any uh, yeah, lacking economic substance entities in between, would you meet this artificially inflated expense rule again? So you go uh, through it again. And when, you go, when I look at this, uh, you know, all those cases we are discussing here, uh, you know, some of them, they are big, big names in the market, like we spoke about Google and Amazon. <coughs> But so what should what should take on other cases where we have a principal structure and we have a limited risk provider or limited risk distributors mm -hmm. in the UK? So how do you see uh, those structures? How are they going to be impacted by uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know they're constituting an awarded P? So what should take on that? Now here I said it's uh, pretty complicated. I think it's best to have a closer look at the examples given in the guidance. The guidance were published on November 30 of last year. It's uh, I think some 120 pages that will help you understand uh, the effort at uh, profit tax. But they consider a number of examples, including what you just mentioned, a typical principal um, LRD structure, uh, where the principal concludes customer contracts and earns the revenue from UK sales. Here the principal has a UK limited risk distributor whose activities has been deliberately restricted so that it cannot conclude contracts. Uh, again, avoiding this uh, PE, although it may help, of course, negotiate within the parameters given by the principle. Well, the guidance here says that since there has been an artificial separation of the conclusion of contracts from the selling activity and the process of agreeing terms and conditions, that no avoided PE arises. And that, that's strange. Would almost say, because the principal is responsible for orchestrating sales across Europe by various product promotions, it's managing relations with major customers at a European level, and actively manages the local LRDs, and that the profit allocation between the principal and the LRD reflected their contribution to the generation of profits from sales to UK customers. 
And this is uh, DPT 1310, example number two, which is a surprise outcome. And this legislation is wide enough to allow, in my view, the conclusion that an avoided PE exists. And therefore, it would have made yeah, more sense for HMRC to conclude there is an avoided PE, but perhaps not diverted profits. And this, therefore, it, it looks like they're kind of kind of selective and yeah, wrote around a little bit more like the example of Amazon and uh, Google. So some. Uh, transactions where we thought they were potentially covered by the legislation is found to be okay and other transactions that are covered by the legislation are suddenly within the scope of the DPT. So therefore you would, would think that the guidance is trying to narrow the, the application on, on one hand, it does seem to narrow it, but it, I think it mainly creates uncertainty to the, to the taxpayers. So, yeah, hopefully, uh, quickly an update to this guidance comes. And I think in the, in the beginning of the guidance, uh, they are asked, they, they ask to taxpayers to please provide examples uh, where you think the DPT is not, uh, yeah matching perfectly. So going to, I think, almost one of the last slides. So do we have questions? OK, let's take the last questions. Uh, we have a question asking, would uh, yeah, what would be the effective tax rate or nominal tax rate? Um, yeah, the, the rate for the diverted profit tax is 25%. So there's a kind of penal element of 5% compared to the normal UK rate. And I think if you are calculating your effective tax rate, yeah, most likely you would take this into account. I wouldn't treat it as uh, VAT or any other uh, charge, but yeah, it will definitely increase the, the effective tax rate. But it, it's an yeah, interesting question. Do you measure it against the 20% the or should you see the DPT as it is 25%? Uh, just may be measured against the 25 So where would you start to, to report and payment? Uh, I think important and, and, and tricky fact of DPT is that companies have to make an uh, yeah, estimate themselves whether or not they are uh, falling within scope of DPT. Um, even if you think you're falling outside the DPT, then you would have to uh, report it why you think you are outside. Okay, uh, question is, if you have a certain amount of profits in the UK that are subject to 20% and the same profits will be subject to DBT at 25%, uh, there will always be a difference between the, the rates. That, that seems unfair. Uh, I think I think when we look at DPT, uh, obviously 25% is uh, higher than 20%. I think there are two reasons why we have this situation. One is that to ensure that uh, the companies are compliant, uh, tax compliant as per uh, the substance value creation they have in the UK. And this 25% is applied on the uh, on the uh, adjusted profit, which is, you know, the, the additional profit which is being allocated for that functionality. So if I go voluntarily disclose that this is my right profit levels, then there's 20% tax. But then we, uh, there's a question that do we run the double taxation? That's a 
question even mm -hmm. common where you have a uh, 25% tax but uh, the difference in this tax rate is obviously to encourage companies to uh, come forward and, and disclose where they feel that you know there is a, a potential DPT charge and if they have to make adjustment to comply with DPT uh, they actually get that benefits uh, and accordingly they get tax at 20% yeah, so so I think the the taxes are either taxed at twenty percent, or if you do not declare them, so it cannot. I think by by definition, not be the same profits, because the the the, the effect of the DPT is the the um, adding up the so-called diverted uh, profit. So by definition, there are different profits, and, yeah. and therefore not taxed yeah. again. And you would have to, uh, come, coming back to the reporting and uh, payment of the DPT on slide 13, and you would have to notify HMRC within six months of your accounting period, and that there, whether or not it's reasonable to assume that DPT applies. That period is shortened in the next uh, year, so it's three months now from 1st of April 2016. What will happen if you make this uh, notification? They will review the information you have provided and make a best estimate of the diverted profits and the diverted profit tax being applied to that. So there you really need to uh, well, properly substantiate your uh, economic substance uh, which, which you described earlier. Uh, where you say, well, the, the what is it, salary benefits are so high, you're really substantiated. Make therefore your own DPT assessment, and I think similar to in the Netherlands, the relationships can be uh, much closer. So speak with your customer relationship manager, your CRM, and provide a thorough analysis to the tax authorities if you, if you have made them and also consider whether it's perhaps more beneficial or not to make a transfer pricing adjustment. And yeah, keep in mind, uh, more and more BEPS is coming, and perhaps also uh, BEPS uh, is providing uh, exits and the deferral of exit tax, as mentioned in the EU draft council directive, might give some uh, escape to avoid DPT on the long term. And you know, one important point which I want to make here today is that uh, we need to see what final light DPT will take, you know, next two years. We have 2017 year also uh, there when we will have this multilateral uh, agreement needs to be uh, needs to be signed. But I think it, it's important for companies to possibly uh, adjusting their intercompany pricing even before the books are closed you know so if it is a regular phenomena where they adjust price pricing then you know one can even uh, reduce the risk of double taxation you know because they're doing within the year and they feel that in their pricing is not correct when they look at the UKDPT yeah yeah I, I think it's something to constantly uh, review um, is, is yeah uh, question, is it now included in the, the questionnaire that's attached to the corporate tax return? Um, good to double check that, but I think the DPT itself, uh, the, the, I think that's uh, something where a company needs to make its assessment itself. And if you, you have doubts, I think uh, at least following the guidance and the legislation, it seems like still you have to notify that you think you're outside of it. And also, uh, lately I was discussing the, the did it influence, for instance, an APA in the UK? My understanding is that currently, if you want to have an APA, the first question will be, or, or question test will be, uh, is DPT applicable to you? to this taxpayer or not and then if the answer is no then you can go into the APA 
And you know, when I look at so in that sense, it's included in the I think the questions are included in the DPT itself, and then. So when I look at corporate tax return, there is a self-assessment regime in the UK. And this, this DPT is away from that self-assessment regime. So the taxpayer has to notify the HMRC for this DPT. So uh, it, it, it follows a separate uh, line, you know, and this is not part of corporate tax. So keeping that in mind, I look at, when I look at uh, UK DPT, uh, it is more like a, a, a regulation which is outside the UK corporate tax and accordingly should be looked into. Yeah, so, the different yeah. forms, yeah, it's different uh, yeah. process. Yeah. Good. Yeah, let, let us. I think this is. Uh, yeah. These are where my slides, at least. Yeah. Uh, we very much welcome all your uh, questions. You can send them. Uh, well, to us, to me, or to uh, to render. And thank you very much for your attention. And the slides will come on the website yeah, as soon as possible. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, you can bear more questions. Uh, our so I think uh, this is again on location savings, which we picked up this point, and uh, there have been adjustment on account of location savings. Uh, but uh, this is something uh, one can look at to calculate non-tax financial benefits for DPT. But uh, when we are doing that, we have to be mindful that, uh, for example, if I calculate location savings at ten dollars, and my analysis says that out of the ten dollars. Uh, you say 20% of that should have gone to the UK company, then that should have already been reflected in the existing transfer pricing. So, so that's why I mentioned that when we do calculations on uh, on on uh, on non-tax uh, savings, if we come across the location savings, we have to be mindful that of those location savings, some portion of location savings which should belong to the UK company. They should have already been reflected in their transpressing policy, and uh, so if I have the balanced location saving, which is again resulting into non-tax benefits, that would uh, possibly build up my argument for the UK DPT to decide uh, whether I have a DPT charge or not uh, when I'm looking at uh, the non-tax savings. Thank you, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. If there are no further questions, this marks the end of our webinar. If you still have any questions, please contact the email IDs on the screen. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thanks.